few seconds and look enthusiastic. <laughs> yes. uh, Any time with I, I say when we look at these screenshots and they're they're shared and everybody's kind of half asleep, especially after lunch, where you're probably getting into that post lunch slumber. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of content over the next two hours, but I will reassure you we'll be stopping for a 10 minute break at three o'clock so you can make a cuppa and get up and move around. Um, I'm looking at social media and web design, but from the point of view very much with the community focus in this session. So I will be asking for engagement in terms of thumbs up or nodding or agreement. I know everybody's muted and we have a really large group, but I still want to get a feel of where people are. Um, I will be talking about tech tools. Some of them will be completely over some people's heads. So I'll be anything I'm talking about, I'll be talking about it from the point of view of the most basic to the most advanced. And I'll be giving you a warning in advance of what not to attempt if you're um, if you're a newbie to tech. Um, and the most important thing that I'm going to address is the fact that every time I'm talking to community groups, they try to reassure me that they have no money. And I'm like, you're not <laughs> needing to convince me in any way, shape or form that there's no budget for marketing. So I don't talk about any tools that require major financial investment on behalf of uh, a community organization. So I try for the most part to focus on free tools. Um, the first part of the session, I'm going to talk about a tool called Canva and how you can use it for social media. So by a Zoom thumbs up, if you could tell me if you are already using it or if you have a knowledge of it. Okay. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, great. I use Zoom, I, am, I was gonna say I use Zoom every day. Of course I do. I use Canva um, every day, but I'm discovering new features every day on things they're improving all the time. So even if you've used it, I'm sure I'm going to show you some additional functionality today. And for those of you who've never heard of it, um, I'll start from scratch. So I'm gonna ask for patience for those who've used it and know exactly what's going on for the first part of the session while I just um, go through it as if you haven't seen it before. The second part, I'm gonna go through tools for designing a website and also for um, sharing content on a website. And I'm gonna discuss the importance of what you should have on a website as a community organization. And some of the pitfalls to avoid that I hear all the time from community groups. For those of you who haven't met me before and are trying to figure out that it's not a Donegal accent, I am down in the Wild West in Mayo. I'm in a place called Kilchima and I have been delivering, since the start of last year, I've been delivering a lot of projects outside of Mayo because of Zoom. Uh, but I primarily work with community and voluntary organizations and charities and social enterprises in training on funding, mentoring, managing um, volunteers. So I have a very, very um, strong awareness of the needs and the struggles and trials and tribulations of everybody working in the sector. Um, so I'm going to start off now by just taking a look at Canva um, and I'm going to use a presentation that Canva actually designed themselves. Um, but before I launch into doing the presentation, I'm going to just take a look at how you would get onto Canva if you're at home and you've never heard it, never heard of it. So the first thing Canva is, you would go into Google and Google canva.com. And I say to everybody, take note that there's no S on the end of that. It's not canvas, it's Canva, because I know the first time I went into it, I kept Googling canvas and forgetting the, what it was. It is a free tool for graphic design, social media presentations. Um, I will go back, I go to the homepage of it and just show you what the interface looks like. Um, so 
Canva can be used on desktop, but it can also be used on your mobile for creating materials for social media. And as you see some of the designs here, you realize that you start to recognize designs that you have seen on social media. It says at the start, uh, design anything. So you literally can design anything from presentations to social media content, to creating video, print materials. Um, I know from doing this workshop lots of times, I've had people who came on that just wanted to know about social media. By the end of the session, they've decided to go and start a business on Canva. They love it so much um, because you see that you don't have to have very strong design skills to use it. Also, it um, has its own design school. So I don't expect you at the end of this session to be complete geniuses ready to rock and go with everything on it. So I want you to know that look in this section up here on learn. There's a whole set of tutorials. There's a little design school. Um, even for anybody that's interested in learning more about the uh, how to design, how colors work, um, and to increase your knowledge around branding and advanced graphic design skills, you can go into the design school on Canva. Most importantly, what a lot of people don't know um, is when you go into the features and the pricing that you go into the features and show you all the products that you can create in it from, I said, photos, icons, uh, print products, um, creating bitmojis, apps for YouTube, um, lots of extra bits. But there is also um, a Canva for nonprofits. So if you are part of an organization that has a charity number, you can get a Canva Pro license if you have a charity number. Um, now, people always ask me, what price is it? So it is free, but there's also a pro version. And in the pro version, you pay for images or designs. But I have been getting, I'm in the pro version now, I've upgraded, but I have been using the free version for years. And I've only upgraded because I've been doing so much um, on Zoom and I've been using so many interactive elements. So the first thing that I'm going to do is click into social media here and show you how Canva breaks up uh, posts by all of the different social media platforms. And one of the things that this does is when people click into it, they start to go, oh my God, not another thing that I need to know because they see a new social media platform and they're only getting to terms with, or getting to grips with using one. So if I scroll over to the right here, you'll see that it's broken up by um, animated social media, YouTube, TikTok videos. Um, I'll talk about TikTok in the second half of the session today, but I don't expect any of you to be on TikTok by the end of the session. But I suppose this just shows you all of the different um, all of the different sizings for social media. Um, now I'll go back to the presentation and just talk you through the more basic elements of um, Canva. So I'm clicking into this Canva presentation and it's taken me into the back, the back end, the dashboard of Canva. And Canva is starting to kind of replace PowerPoint in the way that um, the designs are just way more modern looking than PowerPoint. But where it differs um, is that they have recently introduced an option as well, which I love and I think it's important for anyone to know when it comes to us talking about creating video for social media. Canva has an option in at the side here of present called present and record. So if I take the presentation that I'm about to present and if I clicked into present and record, um, now, I won't record at the minute because my camera and audio has been used for being on this call. But if I clicked into go to recording studio, it will take me in to 
an option where, um, you know, like if you see a YouTube video where somebody's presenting and then the presenter is down in the bottom corner, you just see the presenter in a corner talking over the presentation. So what that means essentially is you could start creating video or you could start creating learning resources for yourself by creating a presentation in Canva. Um, so I'm gonna start this presentation by clicking present. And you'll see that it looks quite like PowerPoint when I start to present and you just click to the left or the right to go. Now I'm gonna fly through this bit because um, there's some bits in it that I think aren't necessarily, um, I may have just talked about them. So Canva, if you've seen any posts like this on social media, they've all been created in Canva. Um, different, some of the things that you can use it for is the fact that in it, you can also access millions of images. Um, some of them paid and some of them free. You can change the layouts and the backgrounds, you can edit photos, um, but you can also collaborate with people. So if you were getting a designer to do some work, you could mock something up yourself and share the design with somebody. Um, most importantly, all of your designs are saved in your Canva account online. So that's what I love about it. Your designs are not downloaded onto your computer. So essentially, if you signed into your, if you went on holidays or you're working remotely, um, I could, uh, I say dream about this. If I went abroad in the morning, I could click into my Canva account and all my presentations are sitting there. So I could work remotely because all my designs are there. So who uses it? Bloggers, marketers, businesses, teachers, students, anyone can design in Canva. And the most uh, question that I get asked is, well, how techy do you need to be? If you can or have done a poster in Microsoft Word, you can use Canva because really you're just going in and clicking and editing and text. So you can use it for business proposals or graphics but most importantly, you can design for social media and share on social media through it. Um, you can also, as I said, design business cards, presentations, invitations. Um, to set up an account, you go to canva.com and you create an account. Um, and I'm going to skip through this bit because I'll show you individual slides on them. You can search through all your designs and you can search for images and items that you need um, you can search for things like shapes stickers arrows um, infographics is probably one of the most important ones for community organizations because even I was, did a workshop or attended a workshop last week on um, measuring your social impact and measuring the work of the organization that you do and how you're the impact you're having in your community and Canva has a brilliant design for infographics where you could put like a poster together showing the facts and the figures and how many people you've engaged with throughout the year, how many projects you've run. And um, when it comes to funding applications and making a case for the work that you do, this is one of the easy ways to do it to create an infographic. So when it comes to me looking in a few minutes and showing you how to actually design, I want you to pay attention to these two images here, because when you're looking at the grass and the clouds, these are little um, grid holders. So whenever you see them in Canva, this is Canva's way of telling you insert a picture here. So it's like a placeholder for an image um, then there's something like this, like a frame. And again, you'll see the cloud and the green background, and that's telling you to insert a picture into the frame. You can look at simple designs like this and add a logo, change the fonts, um, add little, there's a design a logo feature in it as well. Um, and then you can add different shapes or backgrounds. 
one of the things I really like about it is the modern colors and designs that are in it. If you find an image that you like by a particular contributor, um, you can go in and search by the photographer if there's a particular look that you like. Um, and you'll see a price here of $1. If you were buying a pro photo in it or not one of the free photos, the most you'd be paying is one or $2. Whereas if you were or have previously had to buy stock images or stock photos for a website, they were considerably more expensive than that. I know the first time I designed, um, I got my own website designed years ago. I spent 300 euro on stock images because I didn't actually know where I could get them. And I was worried about not having the rights. Um, and so I will show you today where you can get access to photos as well for use in social media. You can get, um, you'll see something like this for layout. So if you need to do collages with like a bigger photo and two small ones at the side, Canva does that kind of thing. Um, you can design designs from scratch or you can go into templates and change the background in them. But I would be telling most of you, don't even put the work in of doing things from scratch because there's bound to be a template there already. So you can customize a template. So for example, this is the original one, the inspiration one, and somebody's just gone in and changed the text, kept all of the layout the same and just changed the background. Um, so all layouts are customizable. This is what I want you to pay attention to, this big T, because when you're looking at the menu in a few minutes in the dashboard, we'll be looking at the uh, how to change text and we'll be looking out for this T. And then if you want to customize text by size based on a headline, subtitle, small body text, you'll be looking out for this one. Here. So when we click on text, you'll see the options are there for adding big text, um, mid-size and smaller. Um, and then there's also the option, and this is probably one of my favorite options, that you can go in and get text done like this already, where they have very fancy, looks really professional, like you would put in an ad, and all you're essentially doing is going in and changing the text. Um, you can change the background and you'll see then as well that the color ranges are um, quite modern looking colors. But if you're somebody that already has a branding done for your organization um, and you want to put your own colors in, you can get the, in the pro version, in the paid version, you can get the exact colors for your own branding if they're not colors that are here, or you can set up your own um, custom setup for your brand. Again, these are examples of different kinds of backgrounds. You can upload your own images as well, so that if you need to upload your own logo or your own images for um, your organization or, um, yeah, it'll store, or if you need to upload videos as well, you can upload videos into it to make your own image and um, video. Or you can upload from Facebook if there's photos already on Facebook. Um, probably one of the uh, questions that I get asked a lot is um, for people, especially starting out with social media is understanding how to save images or what format that you're supposed to save them in. And I suppose one of the brilliant features of Canva as well is that you would normally, if you're downloading an image, click save as image and it will save it as, um, might save as a PDF or it might save as a PNG file. Or you can save a picture image as a JPEG file 
However, Canva also allows you to save your, um, your files as an MP4 file. And for those of you that know already, your MP4 file is the video. So essentially you could go in and put four pictures into Canva and save it as an MP4 file and you're creating a video. That's, that's definitely one of the most useful features. So in my case, when I would have, if I wanted to take this presentation at the end of it and turn it into a video, I can just save the file as a video file and it'll, it'll turn it into a video. Um, there's the option to share and collaborate. And this one you need to be a little bit careful of because when you click share, um, you can share immediately to social media or there's also an option to share with collaborators. So share with someone that you want to work on the design with um, as well. And you can also set the share permissions on a design. So if it was a case that you were designing up a template that you wanted to sell as an image, you can share it with somebody, but you're not giving them the right to design it. You're only giving them the right to view it. Um, so that's important. And there are a lot of people actually making their living now from designing images for social media in Canva and selling them as Canva templates. Um, so again, one of those jobs that we didn't know was going to exist a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that for a second and come back to you just because I hate talking to a Canva presentation and not people. Um, I'm getting used to talking to blank screens, but I suppose one of the, the things that I want to point out before I go on any further and show you how you would design up an image. Um, when it comes to telling your story as an organization, um, more and more community organizations are telling their story through video. And I would be emphasizing to people as we go through um, tools for designing a website, I have, and I said this to a group already today, um, don't put the focus on a really complex, complicated website. Put the focus on the story that you want to tell on the website. And so if the story um, is a simple video created in Canva of somebody explaining to the public what it is you do, what your organization does, who your stakeholders are, who you help, where you're situated, um, it can be way more effective. And for myself, um, I'm in business for about 10 years now and I have dabbled with every kind of a website under the sun. So you couldn't be talking to a better person because I've done all the rubbish to stop um, people making mistakes. I'm gonna say, I've done this, don't do it. Um, so I started out with very simple tools. And as the years, I, I just learned more and more as the years went by based on what customers were asking for, people are coming back and saying, I don't know this from your website. So eventually I, at the start of this year, decided to take a punt on creating an explainer video and I actually got a designer in Donegal to do it for me. Um, and I was sort of skeptical about, is it worth the investment? Should I put it, uh, put it on? And I'm like, oh, please do it now. Invest in video immediately because it had paid for itself within a month in terms of people ringing me up and actually knowing the answers to the questions because the video told them in advance. So questions like who I work with, what kind of services I deliver, they were no longer ringing me up asking, you know, well, what exactly do you do? They'd ring up and say, I, I saw the video and now I know, and I know you worked with so-and-so and whatever. So um, that's the most important thing I would say. Now I paid for my video, but since then, um, even Canva has improved in the ability to have um, 
interactive videos. And I have to say, Margaret, actually, whoever's doing the social media for DLDC are doing a fantastic job from the designs and the branding and the consistency in all of the posts. Um, and I've seen even interactive video elements as well. Um, and it really does, it, it stands out for an organization, that kind of consistency of posting. If you're sticking to the same colors or the colors are matching the brand of the organization, eventually it starts to resonate people and they start to, to recognize um, your post. And on a very basic level, just from a, a business point of view or a branding point of view, I'm absolutely no expert on branding. But what I do know is that when I started keeping things consistent across all platforms, so having the same header on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, eventually the logo started to kick in. People started to recognize it. And again, I see lots of people don't do this. Um, and it's there's a resize option in Canva, which means if you... Um, have already got a, a Facebook header designed or something, you can click resize and it will resize the header for Twitter or for LinkedIn. It'll, um, it'll do it in minutes. And somebody did it for me last year and I was so grateful um, when they did, but I thought they'd spent hours at it. And now I realize they actually just used the resize tool in Canva. Um, so that's just, yeah, really important to keep that consistency. If you do one header, keep it the same across all brands. The other problem with social media, and I really mean it as it's a problem, I cannot keep up with all the trends. I think I finally have my head around how to use one platform and it's completely changed. Or I do up course notes with explainers on where to find something in Facebook, for instance, and two weeks later, it's obsolete. They've changed it all around and it's gone. So, um, and even in the last two weeks, I've noticed new updates in Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And I'll talk to you about those in the second half because they're actually fairly exciting for community organizations, as opposed to useless new features added to Facebook that you're wondering, why are they here? Is it a new level of complication? Um, so I'm going to go back now to Canva and talk you through um, how you would actually design a post. If I can get this to close for me, that would be helpful. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and try and get something else up in the background. Um, bear with me for one second. Okay, so I'll just share that again. Um, so I looked at the home page for Canva. And if I wanted to just go and design a social media post, I click into social media. I'm going to go to Facebook post. And then it opens up. And now when we look at this, you'll start to see some of the things that I showed you in the presentation. They'll start to look a little bit more familiar. So on the left-hand side, we have templates um, and then we have elements. So it's clicked into templates at the moment and it's shown you things that you could use. If I click on elements, it's showing recent elements that I have used. Um, and when I say elements, if I wanted to find, uh, this one of the features I really like about it. If I was doing a post on, or a presentation on LinkedIn, we say, and I just search for LinkedIn, it's gonna give me uh, the LinkedIn logo just sitting there, our images. Now again, 
it's showing up which images are pro and which are free. So I'm going to click on the free LinkedIn one there. And that just jumps in to the canvas there if I wanted to um, work with that. Now, I don't want to, so I'm just going to click on it and I'm, I can either delete there or I could delete on my keyboard and it'll get rid of it. An important thing to note as well, and you'll remember the first time that you learned Microsoft Word was the sizing of the canvas. So I'm in size 33 there. I recommend you probably go up to 50 so that you get an idea of what something's going to look like. Um, so if I go back and leave it there, there's templates and I'm going to click on one of them in a moment. There's elements for shapes and pictures and photos. Uploads is here if you need to upload. If I click into upload, it'll ask me to upload media from images to videos to audio. Um, if I click on text, now we see the text options. So if I click add a heading, um, the heading placeholder will just stay there. And then I'm going to click on this dragger here to move it around the page. So I'm left clicking on this and hold, keeping it held down and moving it up the page. So if I wanted to add a heading, you just put the heading there. If I click add a subheading, that will appear there. And then if I do a small bit of text, it's going to be there. And then you'll see that the top here for all the fonts starts to look very like Microsoft Word if you were using that or any, you'll see all the different fonts. Um, the sizes are here. If you want to add a new page, you'll see the plus here. If you want to copy a page, you'll see duplicate page. Now, I said to you while doing the presentation that I never or rarely do anything from scratch I would always use a template. So I'm going to go back here to a template and pick a social media post. So um, if we look at this one here, coronavirus Facebook post. That just comes like that with the purple background. And you'll see that the purple background is there and can be changed. So if I click on the color, I could change it to pink if I needed to be. That's actually painful on the eyes. Um, if I want it to be like that, if I wanted to, it just gives suggested colors, but you could go in and pick your own colors if you wanted. Now, if I want to change the text, again, like a word, document, I will just go in here and type in my text. Um, I'm just putting in Donegal Volunteer Centre here, just because I'm picking something up off the top of my head. If I wanted to delete that bit in the subheading, I could say welcomes you, or I should say, I'll put it back and say thanks you for your contribution. I should never start trying to talk and type at the same time, but I think I got away with it there. Um, now, if I left that I was happy to go and just post it straight away. You'll see up here, it says publish to Facebook. Here beside it, I have um, a download option. And if I click the download, this will show me where the file types are. So remember I said to you that you can change the way you save a design. So if I had three or four images added there and I wanted to turn them into video, 
I could save it as an MP4 video and create a video through that. So likewise, if you wanted to create a video for your organization, you could pick um, just a Facebook post template, which is this kind of square size. You could add three or four pages, upload your own images, and then save it as an MP4 file, and you have a quick video done up. Um, if we look, then there's the share button, and the share button here is asking if I want to share to collaborate with somebody else. So it's saying I'm the owner, if I want to share with my team. And this bit here will show you the um, who you're given the user rights to the editing rights. So if I click in um, share a link to edit, share to use it as a template or just to view it. If I just click just to view it there, nobody else can go in and edit the design. Um, but if I want to share it as something that's used for different organizations, I can click and have it as a template where somebody else can share it. Um, and then when I'm sharing presentations, I just click copy link and I just shared the link to the presentation in an email instead of having to download it and then upload it again in an email. I just shared the design via a link. But if I did want to share a presentation as not as a presentation, I could go in and share it as a PDF and it would share all of the pages in the presentation and it would allow you to download it. Um, now, in this section here, behind the three dots, there's lots of different features hidden away as well. And when you look in here, it comes with a public health warning. You can go down a rabbit hole and get very excited about all these features. Um, you'll see all the things that you don't know how to do. And if you're like me, you'll feel the need to go in and start looking at them and wondering, you know, how they all work. So one of the new functions that I mentioned is website. Um, you can create a little website in Canva as well. Uh, but I'll talk about that when I come to looking at website tools. Um, you can share to Slack. There's a schedule in posts option as well, but that's one of the pro features in um, Canva. So I'll be showing you how to schedule posts in the second half of the session um, that's not paid for. But if you had a paid version in Canva, you can schedule all the posts um, you can share it to Twitter, um, Instagram, business, email, Google Drive, LinkedIn, Microsoft. And there's one mentioned here, MailChimp. And MailChimp is a newsletter um, marketing tool. And I'll be talking about that after as well. Um, but you just see all these options. Now, I use a tool called Publer, but it's not free for scheduling social media posts. And it goes out over a number of um, different, it goes out over a number of different platforms. Again, um, I got it as part of a, a Black Friday deal, a discounted version, but I wouldn't be suggesting that any of you need something like that, a paid scheduling tool, unless you are um, really posted, unless you're the social media manager for an organization and that's all, that's your main job um, is scheduling all the posts. Ayelish, can I just, what, can you post to multiple sites at the same time without Publer? Yes, you can. Um, well, at the same time, as in you can link up Twitter, Instagram, whatever um, on this, if you have um, attached them, you can kind of just share. It'll ask you, do you want to share to Facebook and Twitter if you want to, or um, whatever ones you've connected and regularly start sharing to, um, it'll allow you to do that. Now, it's a good question, Margaret. I'm always a bit wary as well about sharing to multiple platforms because depending on the 
content that you're sharing, some of it doesn't translate well over to other sites. I'm gonna stop sharing and come back to you. Um, what I mean by that is Facebook has taken over, Facebook has bought Instagram. And when you go to schedule a, a post in Facebook, it'll link in with um, Instagram as well. And it will allow you to share the post to both platforms, but the sizings can be all wrong. And the functionality in Instagram of what you can do in terms of clicking on links and everything usually gets lost. So while you can do it totally, I'm nearly always telling people don't do it. Do, do a separate post for the different platform. Also because the audience that you have on all the different platforms might be totally different people. And that brings me to the point about um, your audience. Does anybody, <laughs> does anybody um, on here know what generation they belong to in terms of the marketing audience? So, um, if I ask you by if I ask you by a thumbs up on Zoom, do you know what a boomer is? <laughs> yes, yeah, so Una's um, Una's telling me she's a boomer. Yeah, I didn't know what this was for a long time till my children started insulting me and calling me a boomer, um, and I was like, "What the heck is a boomer?" I won't even get in and tell them I didn't know what it was. Um, Okay, someone else is, yeah, Philip's been insulted by being a boomer as well. So your, <laughs> your boomers are your baby boomers. Um, and I don't know, I won't start asking people their ages, but you can go and do a search online and you'll hear all the different sections from the millennials to the generation X, Y, baby boomers. Um, and it's actually worth a check. Um, so generation x yeah i think i'm generation x at the minute that's putting me into a category i have to remind them i'm not a boomer in fact i keep telling them i'm about the most trendiest boomer they could know i'm on top of social media but it doesn't matter as a parent you'll never be cool in any way shape or form um so the reason i'm coming to that point is what platform are different people on so for Facebook, there's no young people on it anymore because um, it suffers from a thing. I heard this term and I thought it was just brilliant. So if nothing else, you can say this after today's session. There's a thing called the Levi's effect in social media. So Levi's were cool back in the day until parents started buying Levi's and wearing them and then they were no longer cool so it, that happens with social media something is trendy until the parents or the grandparents find it and then it's like go leave it immediately um so Facebook was cool um back in the day then Snapchat came on board then Insta Instagram Snapchat now it's TikTok and all the all the young ones are on TikTok um, I see the young ones. I have no idea who my audience is today, so I should <laughs> I should actually ask, have we anyone who's primarily on TikTok on today? And you're bound to know way more than me um, about it. But um, the, so Facebook have been trying to regain back the millennial audience, or the younger audience. And they originally set up as a social network for people to, um, or Mark Zuckerberg set it up. And if you've seen the movie, The Social Network, you'd see that he set it up to help people in college to make friends um, and for students to um, make friends. And it's somewhere along the way, because people came on board and investment was required, it turned into a business advertising platform. In the last two weeks, um, when you look in Facebook, they've started a new thing called Facebook Campus. And it's an attempt to win back and lure back the, the younger audience. So it's like a social networking section in Facebook for the younger generation. I can't see it happening. 
that they will use it because they've lots of other different options. Um, but it's one of the new features that's out there. Um, the other thing that I was saying is look at your where your target market is. For me, I hate Facebook, but it's a necessary evil. I use it. Um, but it's taken me years to build up a following on Facebook and nobody sees what I post unless I paid for the privilege um, to sponsor it or boost it. And being as tight as I am, I really begrudge <laughs> paying Facebook to share community posts, especially when a lot of what I share is not, a lot of what I share is information on funding or information for volunteers or for community organizations. So I resent having to pay for it. And I'm presuming I'm gonna put all of you in the same category as well. If you're sharing content that's for the benefit of the general public, um, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have to pay for it. But, so I have moved. Um, and while I'm on Facebook, Twitter is my new hangout and Twitter is where all community organizations are. So if you are not on Twitter, you're missing a trick because that's exactly where the boomers, <laughs> the boomers and, and the community and voluntary organizations are hanging out. Um, also, people tell me that they can't see how Twitter would work for a community organization. And they'll say, is it not just people on ranting um, and giving out and piling on? Um, but I trust me, I'm on it all the time, um, not all the time, but I have been on it the most over the last couple of years. And I have met so many great community organizations on there. And I've met people through, um, we had a last year, a, a Twitter chat um, called the social enterprise chat. And so using the hashtag social, uh, social enterprise chat on a Wednesday evening, I met roughly, and I'm not exaggerating, 50 organizations from around the country just from talking to them on Twitter. Um, and you say, what's the point of that? That group of people that I met on that Twitter chat were what I would call um, my tribe for want of <laughs> People who actually get the work that you do, people who understand the work that you do, and people you can ask questions of. Um, it's the community and voluntary sector is very, very niche in ways. In some of the lingo that you use, some of the information that you'll be accessing. And to be honest, you're not, we're not the most interesting people to sit beside as a dinner party if you're talking about SICAP and social inclusion and uh, metrics and social impact. There's very few people you can talk to about all of the kind of lingo that um, you use in community work. So I would say um, Twitter is, yeah, definitely um, I've been able to use it very effectively from sharing information about funding to talking to other community organizations to doing um, like I put a poll out before on Twitter with community organizations, just asking them what will, you know, what are the biggest needs at the moment? And what could we share resources and materials? And just got so much information back quickly that I'd never have managed on Facebook. Instagram then is um, a dark horse when it comes to nonprofits and community organizations because Instagram to me, and I avoided it again, like the plague. I couldn't see the point of it. I thought Instagram was all um, people just sharing pictures of their breakfast and um, people posing and showing pictures of themselves, but it's changing. Um, and Instagram have introduced some new features which were introduced for the benefit of influencers and I uh, I say the word and I cringe even saying it because I hate it but Instagram was originally people building up a following um, whereas now there's a lot more nonprofits on Instagram and one of the features that Instagram introduced again in the last couple of months is a thing called badges um, 
So if you wanted to do an Instagram live um, and get people to pay you or contribute while you have an event on Instagram, they've added that payment functionality in the last while. Up to now, it was very hard for anyone to take in um, donations or get funding for any event that they held on Instagram. Um, and there's also a donate button in Instagram for fundraising. So while I agree with that, you can't be on absolutely everything. I do think since the pandemic, the social media, um, the companies have started to look at ways that people can bring in an income through social media. Um, another new feature is um, the event payment option in Facebook. So up to now, I suppose, if any of you were organizing classes or anything for your organization, you've probably organized them on Zoom and there's no way for you to collect a payment or anything through Zoom. So Facebook have kind of copped on to this and they're trying to get people to hold classes through Facebook event page and they've added a payments function to that. So if somebody wanted to be doing yoga or art classes or whatever, they can now take bookings through Facebook and get people to pay them through that. Again, that's a new feature in the last couple of months um, and it's not been rolled out to every organization and it'll be rolled out again through um, pages, like a business page. It won't be rolled out through people's personal pages. Um, has anyone any questions before I move on to the next section? Hey, Ilish, I just wanted to ask about Canva. If I was doing, um, if I was working on two different social media accounts, so for example, when I go into my Instagram, I have my own personal, then I have one for work and another one for work. So with Canva, with one organization, they are going to go pro. So I'll have the login details for that, which is fantastic. I can use it. The other organization probably won't need to because it's less content. So can I have two Canva accounts or just one? Um, great question. I know that same for me. I manage a few accounts on Instagram. But for Canva, what I did is I set up two separate accounts. I have the pro one on the laptop and I use the free one on my phone to distinguish between, um, it doesn't allow you to toggle between accounts in the way that it would on Instagram. So you can set up multiple accounts, but you can't manage those accounts in the one account, if that makes sense. So different, so, um, different devices or different email addresses for different accounts? Different email addresses, yeah. So the way that I distinguish for myself is I have a different email address for the, the mobile phone one for the free account. And for all my work stuff, I have my business account one on the laptop, um, if that makes sense. Because otherwise you can kind of get confused. And I did in the beginning. That's why I separated them out. I was getting confused at which was the pro account and which one I could access. And, yeah. and if one company was happy enough for, um, that had their pro account and they were happy enough for me to also use that for the other company if they were, you know, because they're both community. Um, is there a way to have like separate separate files or whatever? Or um, yeah. so if I, if I have the access to the pro account, does that mean that everybody else has, that has access to it has also got access to pictures that I save? Yeah, great question as well. You can set up separate folders and you can share the access on the folders. So you could have, for instance, I have, we'll say the folders on my account are set up in, presentations then they're set up in social media templates and they're set up in say funding presentations as a, a separate file I can go in then and um, only share one folder with somebody so they only have access to certain files in it they don't they don't see the full account they only see a couple of a cup they only see access to the images that they need to see or the okay. files that they need to see so, so really with the pro account, if I have, um, if there's three people that have access to the pro account that have the login details and yeah. I'm one of them, then I can also have my own little section where, I, where, I'm, where I'm using it for the other company with their permission, obviously. 
Yeah. Uh, and the other two people on the pool account won't see the other company's details. It'll be yeah. okay. Yeah. That's perfect. Exactly. Thanks, and, Um I I think Karen, it's it's just a bit of a game changer in terms of the way that you can um it seems to just manage so many things from collaboration to uh, file management to, I didn't mention either that you don't need to save the files, they automatically save. So that old Microsoft Word file and save as, and where's it gone? And where have I saved it problem um, isn't there because it just saves everything automatically. Now that can also create a problem because it saves things that you were only going in messing on that you didn't necessarily want to save. So you can be going back in deleting things if you were just doing up a mock up or a draft. Um, but it's, yeah, in terms of going back in and finding previously worked on documents, it's brilliant as well. It's all in the one place. And sorry, one last question. If I'm using, for example, an account online, can, can I use Canva online and create an Instagram post and then, because I just, thought it was difficult to post to Instagram from the computer, from a laptop. It's easier from your, from the mobile. Or I use, I use the mobile for Instagram um, to post directly because it's just easier. Or I schedule for Instagram in that thing, Publer, that I talked about. It's, it's, it's messy. Um, but I have to say for Instagram in general, I tend to just use the apps on the phone for creating whatever I need. It's just easier to post it directly from the phone to Instagram, more so yeah. than Facebook or Twitter. Um, well, both accounts that I, that I am using, both accounts that I'm working on are, are they're, for both companies are both Instagram. But yeah. the other option I'm thinking is that if I create it on Canva on the computer that I can um, save, that I can uh, send it to my phone and then take it from my phone and put it onto Instagram. Yeah, I think um, contact me after this session, Karen, and I'll give you um, i give you a presentation that I have specifically for Instagram with all the apps for posting um, because I have put a ton of work into it in the last couple of months and I feel somebody somewhere has to see it. <laughs> well, I would definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, because it takes a lot of time to actually go and try out all the tools and find out which ones are useless and which ones are a total waste of your time and which ones are free and, um, you know, which ones are easier to use. I'm conscious that we're coming up there to two minutes to three. And so I don't want to launch into starting the website thing and then stopping again in two minutes. So we might stop now for 10 minutes. Let me just jump in with one very quick question. Can, yeah. I, can you save individual content on Canva so you don't so it stops saving over the previous one? You can copy. You can make copies of new files. Yeah, brilliant question as well. Uh, because I've done that too, where I've gone in and accidentally, like a file and save as in Word, where I've actually gone in and ruined the first design. So you can actually just go in and copy, make a duplicate or copy it and then start a new one and have the original one saved. Um, okay, so we might stop there for 10 minutes. I'll be back at 10 past three. Nobody needs to log out or do anything. Just turn off the camera and mute. And I give that warning because I regularly hear sighs of, oh, thank God that's over for <laughs> the, the tea break. So, um, yeah, hence the warning. Thanks a million. See you back in 10 minutes, everybody. I suppose something that I forget at every session that I do in social media, I forget to encourage the group to collaborate with one another. I find out after the session, we have how many? 27 people here on the call. There's a good chance that a bit of support from the other people on the call for anything you're trying to promote at the moment on social media will be of benefit. So if there's anything that you want to draw attention to, anything that your organization is running, put a link in the chat as well. Or if you want to get a few, swap a few Facebook likes or social media love with somebody else. <laughs> in the group you won't get to ask 20 something other people um to do that and you give back and help out as well so for the second part of the session firstly thank you all for coming back <laughs> i know the cup of tea or coffee was 
a nice little break and it's hard to settle in again to but I promise you I'm going to give you meaningful content for the next hour um, around designing a website on a budget and some of the things that you need to know for the last half of the session then I'm going to look at um, things like creating a newsletter and um, marketing ideas in ways that community groups are promoting themselves again without any budget so I'm going to start sharing the screen um, and getting my presentation up. And while I'm doing that, I'm just going to answer a question that came in um, there during the break. Somebody asked if it had any tips for um, how to migrate a friend's page over to um, a business page on Facebook. Great, great question, because I had to do it myself for an organization a couple of months ago. And first of all, I was horrified that I still had a friends page because it was a fairly big organization. So I set about trying to regain their followers from the friends page to the new business page. And I can say that three quarters of the friends followed over onto the new page, but it was a case of having to um, send them a prompt to follow the new page so there is an option in Facebook to go in and encourage um, friends to like the new page so you set up the new business page and then invite all from the friends page um, you won't get everybody you lose people um, but it's about creating awareness around the fact that there is a new page um, and trying to remind people through the friends page that you're migrating over um, also find a reason for getting them to move from one platform to another have something compelling on the new business page that will actually attract their attention um, to come over and join you either discounts or vouchers or valuable information um, so i'm going to skip through here quickly on because i know a lot of you will probably have a website already but um and we'll know a lot of this, but I'm still going to talk about the importance of it. Um, so what I think your, your site should do is have a map with directions. Um, a lot of people are missing this. And um, the reason I say it is if funders are trying to look you up online and figure out where you are, um, really important that there's uh, exact details on the website of where you are because while everybody locally and probably and I won't even say in your county because I see it even with uh, groups in Mayo this morning half of them never knew where some of the places were in their own county so don't take it as a given that everybody knows where you are especially if you're in a rural area and um, give as much detail as possible about what it is you do and what you're working on um, I'm going to say have contact details again people say oh my god that's so obvious but what isn't obvious is having a mobile friendly site that uh, and what I mean by mobile friendly that people can see it really clearly on the mobile but that there's a clickable link to the number for people to call if they're accessing you from mobile if they have to go away and go searching for your phone number and write it down somewhere and go back and ring you again, they're less likely to ring you than if they can click straight into the link on the site. Um, being able to book tickets through a website is really good. I know a lot of people are using Eventbrite for organizing um, fundraisers and events, but um, being able to integrate it into the website is good as well and I'll show you a tool to do that in a bit. Um, make it easy to add photos and also if you share stuff on social media have it integrated into the website so that the feed shows up on the website and you don't have two jobs to do. Um, now here are a list of some of the options for uh, designing a website. And this is going from the pure beginner, I haven't a clue phase to, yes, I've done stuff before, to, yeah, I'm fairly techy. Um, so I'll start off by looking at Wix and Weebly. Wix and Weebly are what they call drag and drop 
options, which means if you can design in Microsoft Word, you can use these. It's like what I just did in Canva there. You're going in just changing photos and text. You're not doing any coding. And I mentioned that Canva can also be used for creating a mini website. So Canva has that website function as well. So if you go into it and just search website, you'll see um, a few templates. This is another one that I don't use that much, but I, I've seen some of the designs. It's okay. I think called Webador. Um, and Weebly is the one that most community organizations used. And when I went in to check it yesterday, I see it's been taken over by another company um, and primarily because they're adding e-commerce functionality to it. A lot of community organizations are adding a shop um, and an e-commerce option. And so Weebly has kind of moved with the times um, on that. And that's a whole other conversation we could have for another day, but I couldn't emphasize enough how important it is. Um, I work with a lot of community organizations who say they want to set one up and they're going, but we don't have the money. And I hope by the end of this session, you'll at least realize that you don't need, if you invest in an hour or two's training for yourself, like you're doing right now, that's all you really need to set up a shop. Um, WordPress, people will have heard of WordPress from a blogger's point of view, but also WordPress, about 40% of websites are designed in WordPress, but it is not for people who are not that confident with tech it's harder and I wouldn't go near it till I've at least gone down the the Wix or the Weebly route and um, the one I have my own website in is a thing called strikingly I suppose I've mentioned that Google have websites as well there's an option in Google my business to set up a website and I'll take a look at that too in a little while and um, strikingly and mighty networks I've listed here strikingly is not free but if you have a tiny budget, um, I say a tiny budget, I'm saying 20 euro a month. Now people will say that's not a tiny budget. I manage five websites for hosting and domain registration and email addresses and newsletters off that fee. But I've done it all myself. If I got somebody in and paid them to design a website from scratch, I would probably be talking about a thousand or fifteen hundred euros minimum. So it really isn't that much um, and I'll demo how to use those in a bit. If you are registering a domain name from the very beginning, you can go into some place like a website called GoDaddy to check for the domain name. So see if somebody has registered it already and if you can get the right to register. it. Here are some do's and don'ts for community organizations. And every time I deliver this, I'm going to stop sharing and come back to you. Every time I deliver this, I enjoy watching the nods the other side of the screen or the laughing because all of the don't do this that I discuss, people are like, oh my God, we did that. Or, oh, that's us. Um, so I'm going to share again. I'm not going to see your faces, but I'm sure you're nodding away going, yep, we did that. Um, or that happens in our organization. Um, so never leave it to one person in an organization to set up the website and leave it all on their own because i've seen where volunteers with the best intentions in the world uh, with tech skills come on board do the website or the only one who knows the password the only one who knows how to edit it and then they leave and the organization hasn't the first clue what to do with the website or how they're supposed to move on with it and um, also so have a subcommittee and even if two people on the subcommittee have no clue whatsoever about designing the website, at least have them taking part in meetings so they know the password and the domain name and the costs and things like that behind the scenes so that if one person does uh, leave, the knowledge is in the organisation. Uh, also, if you're paying a professional, get very clear details on what the fees are that you're going to be paying in the future. In terms of fees, um, it can range anything from hosting, um, from doing a bit of a survey with groups. I don't think you should be paying more than 100 euro a year for hosting. So some people sign up with something like GoDaddy in the beginning and get a deal on hosting over a couple of years. But be aware that if you're getting a professional to design your website, ask them, what are you going to be paying for hosting in 
uh, following years, um, what will your website maintenance fees be? Because I've heard time and time again, people coming back saying, we paid 1500 euro, we paid three grand, whatever. And then they wanted to bill at 300 euro a year. And I know how colossal that is for organizations who are struggling just to get tiny bits of funding in. Um, so make sure you know where your domain name is registered. Um, and I'll show you in a, a slide or two how to find that out. Also, when I look at the analytics on my own site, it tells me 70 to 80% 80, 70 of people that are accessing the site are accessing it from mobile. So make sure that whatever you design, that it's mobile friendly. Um, learn a bit about search engine optimization. And what that means is basically, what are people typing in to find you on Google? Are they typing in the name of your organization or are they typing in what it is you do? So if you are um, a support organization for mental health or you're a befriending service or a family resource center, are people typing in um, family resource center and the town you're from or are they typing in um, youth facilities in Letterkenny or, you know, very specific words and find out what people are typing in and what's um, make sure that you have that text on your website and that you can get found for that. Have a few administrators to the website, going back to what I said about the subcommittee, because um, you need a few people to know what's going on. But the last bit is the most important here. Um, have a policy about what goes on the website and what doesn't. Now, this isn't as big of a deal for organisations that are um, set up with paid staff. It's more for voluntary organisations where the rules are a little bit, there's a few grey areas. Uh, this is never an issue except around election time where the waters get muddied and I'll come back to you. I can't emphasise this enough. I see people regularly abusing WhatsApp groups and abusing uh, social media in terms of the content that they post. The lines blur over what is actually relevant to the community organization and what somebody publishing to promote their own personal interests or business or whatever. That's really awkward if you're on a committee and you're trying to police that. So the only way to protect yourself is have a communications policy document um, when you're doing the website. At a meeting, have a discussion, what goes on Facebook, what goes on social media. Um, I'll give you an example and I know if you all have heard of it and you will, you will laugh at my expense if you're Donegal GAA fans, you can sympathise with the Mayo GAA fan. But there was a business in Roscommon that um, one time, one of the times that we got kicked out of a final, and I can't even name, there's been so many, um, but somebody in Roscommon posted up on a business page something like good enough for the Mayo ones on the way home or something or delighted they got beaten. Just a staff member having a rant, except for the fact that it was uh, a supermarket that 80% of the fans stopped in on the way home from the match to buy their supplies and the manager was far from impressed. Now, would he have sat down and written up a policy saying, don't post this kind of thing? You know, so I suppose it's just having very clear guidelines with people of what's acceptable in terms of your public, your personal opinion and what's the party line, for want of a better word, um, in an organisation. So believe it or not, you do actually need to be very specific on what people can and can't post. Now, if, if you know a piece about design and you know WordPress, you can um, see... Um, if you've seen a website that you like the design of, you can figure out if it is a WordPress theme and you can look at the design that you like, type the URL into this website, what WordPress theme is that, and figure out if it was designed in WordPress and what template was used and what plugins or add-ons were used. Um, so again, why would this be important? If you are getting a professional to design the website for you, it's great if you can pick out as many examples of sites that you like already that uh, can help them get an idea of what it is you're trying to achieve. Now, this 
who dot is is a way for you to verify who registered uh, a website is it legitimate and uh, who owns it and where this is important is um i stop sharing and come back to you where this is important is if you're managing a page for a town for instance if you're volunteering for um I'm half afraid to pick a town in Donegal out here because there'll be somebody sitting here going, yeah, that's me. Um, we'll, I'm just going to say Letterkenny, letterkenny.ie. You're managing the page for that, or I don't even know if there is a page, but I'm presuming there is. Um, and a new committee is taken over and they want to figure out uh, who registered the page, when was it registered, how long is it in existence. In some cases, back in the day, County councils registered the domain names for towns so that they could protect them from people just randomly registering their local town's name and trying to sell it back to them. So you can go into who.ie's to find out who set up a community page, basically, so that if you need to take it over. Um, and I can't tell you how often I've heard this as a problem. People saying, well, a committee set one up five years ago, but we don't know who has the details. We don't know who registered it. We don't know when it's, um, as well as that, who.ie is for all the men on the call that I'm sure are ardent shoppers and online shop and constantly buying online. It's important for you to know whether a shop is real or not. I'm conscious when I say for the women shoppers, everyone's going, it is not only women shopping, but um, if you want to check, and especially during the week, I saw an ad for a shop on Instagram and clothes that I liked, and I was thinking, God, that looks really good. And if it looks good, and if it looks too good to be true, there's probably something wrong with it. So I went and checked in who .is, who is, and it was a dodgy website. And there was truth, tr uh, you can also check up for, um, who registered it and if it has a trust rating as a site. Um, so just really useful to know, especially as well if uh, you have teenagers and they're buying things online and you don't know what they're buying off and you want to just check the legitimacy of it. Um, so some of the tools I just mentioned there, um, you can use Canva for logo, you can use Wix for creating a logo or um, Google My Business for creating a site or Google Sites. Google Sites, I've not got on the design at all, but if somebody just needs a bare bones of a website, they'll do the job. Um, and then in advanced tools, I'm mentioning Airtable, Notion, Coda. For anybody who's registered in the ma Managing Your charity fi Charities Finances section, I'll be doing more advanced um, training on these tools here. They're, they're more advanced techie tools, but they're more for setting up systems for community organizations. Um, in terms of video marketing for your site, you can use any of these tools from Animoto, Typeito, Wave, um, Vimeo Create. Currently, um, this is the one that I'm raving about for Instagram, Adobe Spark, Pro. Now, in the past, you'll hear of Adobe for um, Photoshop and InDesign, and I have always found Adobe products very, very hard to navigate and use and learn, except for this one. Adobe Spark Pro is an app that uh, you can have a, pay, a free version and a paid version. But you can create really, really good video content for um, social media from the app on your phone. Um, Again, you don't need huge knowledge on um, video creation. It's kind of like Canva. It's going in and just changing pictures and editing, uh, editing text. So people will ask as well about where to access free images. And I mentioned it earlier. If you Googled free images for social media at the minute, you would probably get a list of about 20 sites. And I could have listed 20 or 30 off for you. But the two that I use are Pixabay and Unsplash. Now, uh, Pixabay is really, really good for accessing images of kind of a commercial nature. So things like if 
you were uh, promoting an event or you were selling products with like um, discounts or sale on or free now, that kind of thing. Whereas Unsplash has a lot more content that's related to uh, nature and the outdoors and maybe physical activity, well-being, that kind of thing. The most important thing about both of these is the fact that um, the people who've donated the images on it know that they're going to be used for free and there's an option to um, give credit to the person who donated it. Um, now again, I'm going to come back to you because I want to talk about the importance of Unsplash there. Has ever, how many people on the call have heard of Unsplash before? With a thumbs up. Yeah, so, um, okay. Unsplash is a platform where people can donate their own images. They don't have to be, and they're providing them for use for the public. But a lot of tech companies have started linking in with Unsplash to offer the stock photos. Now, in the last couple of months, I've been working with a lot of tourism organizations and we've been using Unsplash. And when I go to search for images of um, place names, there's a very tiny bank of them. So I would be urging anybody who's involved in a tourism organization or market in a local area, if you have any high quality images, donate them to Unsplash um, and allow people to use them because you want people to be creating uh, materials and posts about your area uh, and to be promoting your area. So, Go into Unsplash and do a search at some stage, do a search for Donegal and see what shows up. Or if you went in and did a search for Sleeve League or um, Wild Atlantic Way or whatever, there's not a huge bank of images. And again, I'm emphasizing that it's the general public that are feeding that content. So it's in everybody's interest to keep a steady supply. I think everyone should, part of any town should go in and just upload an image, even if it's only an image of the sign for going into their town for anybody that can, um, that can use it uh, to publicize it. Um, okay. The one of the tools that I mentioned there, Typeito for creating videos, they use Unsplash. So if you needed to create a video and then just upload the content with the local um, the local um, images in it, that's one way. I have put in my links at the end of this. So if anybody wants to contact me. Um, the contact details will be in the presentation, but you're not getting away that easily. We're not finished yet. <laughs> I have more stuff to go through. Um, and I, I suppose I want to talk as well about something that I think is really important in social media that I never paid full attention to till I started to read up on it. So I'm going to talk about something called user generated content. Has anyone heard that term before? So user generated content is content that, yeah, Jackie has content that people are uh, creating, talking about your product or talking about your organization. So it's very hard for organizations with limited resources to spend their time creating content for themselves. It, your time is a lot better spent getting your public and your stakeholders to create content and tag you in it or mention your organization. So even things like competitions where you're getting people to design something for you or you're getting people to um, share, I suppose, share pictures when they're visiting your area or anything that you can do to get your public to create content that's relevant for your organization is time well spent. So if you had a competition on Facebook for images of your local area or, and I, people are have them all, especially in lockdown where we've been walking the roads, there's millions of pictures floating around 
Um, so just even having a competition and asking people to share content, but also to be very aware that if people are sharing content that you're also asking for permission to share it, you know, or, um, or use it in the future. Um, so finding out what content is already out there. Um, in, when we talk about Instagram as well, uh, there's a, a new feature in Instagram called guides. Has anybody heard of it by a thumbs up? No, okay. So Instagram guides was set up originally. It was one of those features that was kind of sneaked in guides as in tour guide, Una. Um, so it, um, yeah, it was a feature that was set up originally during, at the start of the pandemic for mental health organizations to anybody working on health and well-being to create guides that would be of benefit to people in the pandemic. And then Instagram rolled it out as um, a feature that's available to retailers and businesses. Um, so it has, it's very hard to try and explain it to you, but if you look at it now, um, it has things called product and places in it. Um, so if somebody wanted to create a guide, it's really curating a couple of posts that you have on Instagram and creating like a little booklet, but it stays on your profile. Whereas everything else that you create in Instagram will disappear. Well, it'll stay in your feed, but if you wanted uh, to try and explain this, when people arrive in a location and they tag themselves into that location, all of those posts are searchable on Instagram. So if you wanted to go and do, um, if you wanted to go and do a little um, guide on walks in your local area or amenities in your local area, if you go and search by the geotag, by the location link in Instagram, you can find all of the local services or businesses in your area and create a little guide in Instagram of their content. Now, I'm aware that I could spend the two hours just talking about guides alone, but I felt like I have to mention them because they are one of those little tricks that people are missing at the minute. And get in early. Um, if you start doing searches for guides for Donegal on Instagram, there's probably not a huge amount at the moment. So get in before the rest. Um, has anyone any questions before I move on to the last section? We're nearly there, folks. I'm thanking you for your attention, for hanging in here. For Wednesday is called what on social media? Hump day. <laughs> Hump day. So Wednesday is the day where everybody's sluggish. And, but it's actually the day where most people engage on social media because they are in that little DOS phase that kind of energy levels waning. So people get the most engagement on Wednesdays on Instagram, which is a piece of useless information for you. <laughs> but uh, even if you go on to, if you go on to Instagram and search the hashtag hump day, it's now become a thing or even Wednesday wisdom. So if you only post it once a week and you post it on a Wednesday, there is a greater chance of it being seen um, also, when you're creating content, trying to figure out when are people or when are the people who engage with your content, when are they online most? Uh, hump, <laughs> hump day, not hump tea. <laughs> yeah, hump like camel hump. Um, so you have to think about, again, getting back to the boomers and um, the millennials, when are people online? So if, you're, if your target market is um, uh, people at home, parents at home, chances are 9.30, 9, 9.30 in the morning after people have done the school run, they log on and check their social media. They mightn't be on for the rest of the day until nine o'clock at night. 
social media comes alive after nine o'clock at night and yet nobody's posting at nine o'clock at night because they're tired. They might be scrolling, but they might be actually promoting anything at that time. So that's where your scheduling comes in handy. Anything that you'll have scheduled to go out after nine o'clock at night, there's a greater chance of it being seen. Now, I know that Donegal is as equipped as Mayo with amazing transport facilities. So there's the Lewis, there's the, there's nobody commuting on public transport in Mayo or Donegal. But if your audience is somebody that's on the Lewis or on the train or coming home, they're your commute audience. So posting for 7.30 in the morning when people in cities are sitting down and actually scrolling, that's a good time as well. Again, nobody's at work at that time. So anything that you have scheduled to go out at uh, commute time, which can be between five and six or uh, earlier in the morning. And again, I'm sure nobody on the call here is looking at, and maybe I'm wrong, there's nobody looking at an American audience here or an Australian audience. But at one stage when I started out in social media, I was scheduling content and I was getting, I was getting traction from people in Australia and I was realizing it was because I was, um, I was scheduling at strange hours of the night. So people were finally seeing the content. Um, so again, if your audience, think of time zones, think if you're, which I know none of you are engaging with people in America, probably, but if you were, remember that they're seeing things at different times to when um, you're seeing them. So I'm just going to get up another presentation just to completely confuse you. Yeah, just when you're putting that up, can I ask just quickly with Pixababy and with Upsplash, if you do take an image, do you have to credit or it's it's just an option that you want to? Because that's new. I see it's new when you go on now to. Yeah, it's it's manners. Um, you don't have to credit them on Pixabay, but they do. A lot of people share their content just because they're trying to um, they're trying to. I suppose maybe promote their own photography skills or design business or whatever. So there's a couple of options. Sometimes if people will say credit us, they might say like us as a thank you, like give a social media like as a thank you. Or there's a service called Buy Me a Coffee, which if you are downloading a lot of images, you might just click on that. So in answer to your question, you don't have to, but it's it's manners to acknowledge it. They just don't make it that easy, like because you, you have when you're in download an image and then you and you're yeah. like you want to concentrate and get it up, you have to follow the whole either Twitter or Facebook or sign in or go to your Gmail or send them a thing. There's no quick option to just be like, yes, thank you. Yeah, I know what you say, and I, I don't um I don't credit every single one, but if I was downloading four or five, I'd do a like. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is acknowledge it more yeah. than attribute it. Um because it's it's hard work. If you were doing it on every single um, on every single post, um, okay, thank you. So I, um, oh yeah, Gillish, one other very quick question. Somebody just asking, can you schedule one post for multiple times instead of um, yes. creating and scheduling it individually? So you can you have one post? You can. You can add. Um, you can add a couple of different times that something's going to go out and repeat. Um, now on Facebook, if you're doing the individual scheduling, I think it just it just lets you do it one at a time. It's more the scheduling tools will allow you. I didn't mention there's another tool called Buffer. Uh, Buffer has a free version, and that will allow you to schedule to a couple of different platforms. Um, at the um, at the for the free version. It will, um, just hold on a second. I think I got lost here. I closed down a few things. Um, okay, so you can see social media awareness, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, so for this last session, the last while, I'm going to just use this as a resource. Don't worry, I've talked about a lot of the things that uh, are in this presentation. But I want to also emphasize that um, 
you can use any of the resources that I'm sending out to you. If you need to train people in your own organization, take these presentations and use them. I'm happy as long as they are, as long as you're not charging anybody presenting. If you want it for in-house training, uh, go for it. So the, this tool here that I want to talk to you about is a thing called review. And review, I only found out literally yesterday. Review is um, a newsletter creation tool that has been now bought by Twitter and it's incorporated into Twitter as a new feature for creating newsletters in Twitter. Um, I started using review in 2019 and I was raving about it uh, because what it lets you do, and I don't know if there's anybody, many of you there creating a newsletter, but I was creating a newsletter on funding and community and voluntary organizations. And what used to happen is I'd send it out at the end of the month and I'd have a mad scramble trying to find content, all lastminute.com and be in a complete dither until I found review. And what it allowed me to do was every time I found a piece of content, it allowed me to clip it and save it into the newsletter. So if I found a new funding application or I found a new uh, training event or a new, anything that would be on um, ActiveLink website, those kind of information. So training, voluntary news, um, I clipped it and put it into review. Then GDPR came along and made it really difficult for using review because you have to go back and get all the um, new signups from people to subscribe to get permission to get it. So this is coming with the warning as well. But now it is free through Twitter. And I'm saying if you do have to create a newsletter, have a look at it. It's just brilliant. It incorporates all of the links um, I talked about Facebook paid online events and here's the link for it if you need to go after the session and look back at it. Um, and again, I talked about all of these things, but I just want you to use the presentation yourself. Um, so scheduling posts and sourcing content or using Wix. Um, and to talk about marketing options with no budget. Um, the kind of things that, the kind of campaigns that people are coming up with. So I mentioned there, there's Pixabay is one of, um, one of the ways of getting licenses. There's your domain name, uh, register. Um, and this is kind of getting stuck, but I think it's coming to a website called Visme. Oh yeah. Here's a link on how to schedule a post in Facebook. Um, again, I could go in and show you right now and you won't remember five minutes later. So it's easier to go back in and follow the instructions on this. So um, in terms of creating or getting word about your community organization out there without having any budget, I spoke to an organization recently and ask them what, um, how come I was seeing them everywhere on social media? And they told me that they had hired a PR person for a day a month. And I was like, what? I was, <laughs> I so, I, it just wouldn't have dawned on me for a community organization, but it was, they had a budget and it was paying dividends. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing and come back to you because I want to talk to you about press releases and writing up a press release for your organization or creating PR. Um, and again, I have no idea who's, have, are there any journalists on the call today? Is there anyone who writes up press releases for their organization? No, not that I can see straight away. Well, I worked for uh, Una does features, okay. I um, I worked for an organization years ago and it was the greatest grounding in PR and self-promotion. And it was because the head of our organization was a politician. 
and they had learned exactly how to get a story out there. Before that, I was completely green. I used to think that a journalist came and knocked on the door and said, we think you're great. Will I write up a piece about you? And then I realized, no, that wasn't how it worked. We wrote up all our own press releases and we sent them into the paper. Um, and we were never out of the local paper to the point that I used to kind of cringe sometimes because people would say to me, oh, you're doing this again or you're doing that. And I would be kind of embarrassed because we had written our own little um, blurb piece. So my point is, if you're not informing the general public about the work that you're doing, nobody's going to come and knock on the door. They might if you're really getting their attention. But most of the time, it's people writing up a piece about the work that they're doing or putting that story on social media themselves. Now, how can you tell that story? Um, when it comes to tidy towns groups, it's a really easy one to tell. The before and after pictures, the derelict sites and the new look of what something looks like. The story behind how many people got together at a weekend and worked on creating something. If you're working with certain organizations, you can't tell your story. If you're working with vulnerable people, you can't roll them out for a press release. And um, so it's a real challenge. But if you are working with an organization, where you give out advice and support. You can do a number of things like writing up your own press releases, creating a video there in Canva. If you have any wannabe movie stars that are not afraid of getting in front of the camera and creating your own video, doing a, 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 here's a little bit about us and the work that we do. Now, again, I say to people all the time, chairperson of an organization might be the shyest, most introverted person on the planet who would die getting up uh, on video. It doesn't have to be the committee. If you find anybody in the organization who's not camera shy, get them to do a little piece for you. You can also create um, guides and infographics and eBooks. Um, I use a tool by a brilliant company, an Irish company in Belfast called Beacon, as in a beacon of light, uh, B E A C O N, Beacon eBooks. And they have resources for um, self publishing an eBook. So if you want to do any, they also have an option to do an eBook with a, a video YouTube link in the middle of it. So if you needed to tell a story, by an ebook, and you wanted to actually put videos into it as well. Um, really, really useful. Not free though, but totally worth it in terms of the PR that you would get out of it. Um, the other, again, it depends on the organization, the types of resources that they have. Going on local radio. Um, I don't know what it's like in Donegal, but you cannot underestimate the audience on um, like you've Highland Radio, we have Midwest Radio. And I was asked to go on one day to do an interview on Midwest about remote working in the West of Ireland. And I was like, sure, I don't know much about it, but the remote had said, will you go on because this was before lockdown. Little did we know, this is about a month before lockdown where remote working wasn't as, as big a thing. So I convinced myself, oh, sure, it's grand. There'll be nobody listening. It'll be fine. I'll just pretend that I'm talking to myself in the sitting room. Talk to myself into calming down anyways. Oh God, the world and their mother were listening to Midwest radio, local radio. I went down to the shop. I heard you on the radio. I heard, and I thought, oh, there's a lesson for me. I might not be listening to the local radio station, but my audience are on it and they're listening. And it's a very, very free way. And they're looking for stories. So it's also an option for you to get in touch with your local radio station and say, if you are doing any features, give us a shout. We'd be happy to talk about fundraising events. And we always used um, the local radio station to promote fundraising events and always got, because uh, we have one or two people in the organization that are not scared of the radio and love going on, giving an interview. So find those people um, and use them. So for the last couple of minutes here, um, I want 
just to answer your questions because we're coming up to four minutes to four. Um, if you have no questions, you can run for the hills, but I'll stay here until four um, to deal with any questions that maybe might have gone through um, from things that we discussed there. Um, on the Facebook friends versus like pages, are you starting from scratch? Yes, I'm afraid you're starting from scratch with a new page. Um, the, and it's really hard, but I would also ask, um, and Edward, I don't know if you're comfortable unmuting there and actually talking to us, but it depends again. Um, I'm not 100% convinced oh, it's worth putting huge amounts of work into building up a Facebook following from scratch again, if it's a younger generation, I would put the work into Twitter or Instagram. Um, I mean, obviously you need one, but you'll get more return from putting work into Instagram than you will from Facebook at the minute. You're a problem. You can link the two though, can't you? Sorry? You, you can directly link the two, can't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that the amount of work that you put into building up a following um, is, is not- is there, is, is there not a worry with Facebook might take the page down, no? They, yeah, there is. For a friend's page, they totally have the right to take it. And I've known people that it's happened to where they have removed it because people are using the friend's page. And the reason they remove it is because they can't get you to pay for anything if it's a friend's page. So on the business page, it's all the advertising function. So if they don't start taking down the friend's pages, then people will be saying, well, why will I, uh, why will I migrate over and get the business page or the community page? Um, but yeah, no, no easy way. And I know I, I worked with an organization about two weeks ago that has 6,000 Facebook um, likes on their business page. And they're seeing about like six, uh, they're seeing like maybe uh, five to 10% of people are actually seeing their posts and they're getting a tiny amount of engagement without sponsoring it or without paying for it. Um, so, yeah, and, but I would say getting Facebook ads training, even if it was only 20 minutes, looking at advanced Facebook ads training is worth it if you are going to be paying for something to get a little sense of how you can really target and get the best value for your money. Um, and again, I ran from that for the hills for years. I ignored it and thought I don't need to know it. And then I looked at it and went, everybody needs to know this. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard enough to learn. But if you are techie, spend a little bit of time getting your head around it and you'll get more return on investment. Even in, it's probably better value to pay 30 or 40 quid to try and build up the pages following through sponsored posts um, than putting a ton of work in creating organic posts. Okay, thank you all so much for your attention. I'll be sending out the 10 million presentations I did there uh, to Margaret and she can forward them on. Again, if you never look at them, I don't care. It's just keep them as a reference for somewhere down the line if you need to go back over. And if you do need to use them, feel free, go ahead. Thank you all so much. Take care. Thanks, Elish. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Elish, have you got time?